Welcome back, Quamp Bros, episode eight. We are back. We got orange ties. We're looking good. We're going to get into it. Okay. This is Quamp Bros, episode seven and a half follow up. Um, we've, we're going to go through quite a few things here. We're going to go through what's happened. What's happened since Quamp Bros, episode seven? So much has happened. So much has happened that we're not even going to cover everything. Um, we're going to go, we're going to go over valuation. This is going to be a quick run through of Quant Bro 7.5. We're going to talk about a Tesla comparison. We're going to look at some price and search interest comparisons and correlations. And then Ryan is going to dive into variance, implied volatility and volume and get real nerdy with some math and some numbers and looking at graphs and charts and things. So with that said, Ryan, welcome back. Feeling better? Yeah, no, uh, feeling good, man. Needed an extra day to uh, get prepared mentally and physically. And I think it's uh, kind of interesting that some of the characters in the MSTR Twitter verse or Twitter space are, uh, they're almost like preying on our downfall, thinking like, oh, Jeff put a solo episode out, so there must be you know, trouble in paradise or the band's breaking up. And uh, I just don't think they understand how, uh, how low and long our time preference is on this stuff. So I, I see us doing this well into the future, if I'm being honest. Absolutely. Absolutely. We are, we are ripping and roaring. Q4 is going to be insane. 2025 is going to be crazy. It's going to be a fun stock to watch. We're going to talk about everything MicroStrategy and Bitcoin. And um, yeah, I appreciate everybody that's new here, everybody that's been watching for every single episode. Apologies, you know, summer gets the best of us. Everybody's out going to do things, right? Um, you know, going to the lake, fly fishing, getting out uh, and taking advantage of the nice weather. But, you know, here in the Pacific Northwest, it's about to... Uh, it's about to ch it's about to change uh, and get into this kind of fall winter weather. So I, I think uh, quite a bit more on the on the horizon. Yeah, and I just want to uh, double down on that idea because you know a couple of years ago there was really nobody talking about micro strategy. It was still just a hardcore group of disciples who were Bitcoin only type people, and then you know characters such as Mark Harvey, who I, who's my absolute bull, wicked smart guy characters like myself and Jeff started to, you know, poke our heads out. But since then, the change has been like so remarkable in the amount of people who are coming together to bring like their area of expertise or their thing that they're interested in. Some of it's silly and memes and some of it's like, you know, PhD level work, like, uh, like what Ben Workman has been putting out these past couple days is honestly like a PhD dissertation understanding of the nuances of a cash flow statement and MicroStrategy's balance sheet. And he's doing all this stuff for free, right? Just, just putting it out because we're interested in it and we want to talk about it. Um, and we're not doing all the, all the like and subscribe and, and all that kind of stuff. No ad reads or anything like that. Um, and then you look at someone like Mason, who's really been piecing together a lot of interesting things and putting together into these nice visuals with great write-ups. You've got people like Dan Hillary and Nithu who are pushing content just every single day. You've got Grain of Salt coming in, talking about rehypothecation. You've got Jeff doing a solo episode. You've got Josh Mandel providing um, you know, wisdom that can only come from someone who's been doing what he's been doing at such a high level for so long. So I say all of that to say it's almost like we've got a great problem on our hands when there's still like too much content and not enough time. Um, but like I said, it's, it's a great problem to have. And I can speak for me and Jeff on this. We learn a ton from what everyone else puts out. We're not trying to act like we have all the answers. It's an ongoing research thing. Um, so I just wanted to you know, kind of give that shout out. And then if I can share my screen here briefly, I want to kind of just build on this and then we'll, we'll start getting into our stuff. Yeah. Huge, huge thank you to everybody and keep doing it. Right. Like it, that makes the, that makes everybody stronger. Uh, I appreciate all the work everybody's been putting in um, and echo Ryan's comments for sure. I mean, we got the, uh, we got the discord and like all of the, like, this is just the page that I happened to pull up when I was logging into the discord. We've got, you know, a Reddit community that's very active. We've got, you know, people on LinkedIn, even employees of MicroStrategy kind of like bull posting content from, from their LinkedIn. So between 
the amount of platforms that we have going on right now, I really think we're in a situation where every minute of every day, including weekends, there's at least someone talking about micro strategy or, or learning about it. And I think it's a really a uh, it's a really interesting and, and special thing that that we got here, you know. And th- these conversations are pretty wide reaching. I mean, what what micro strategy is doing on a corporate level right now is fascinating for every single corporation in the entire world. Right. Uh, th- this is this is proof of concept of how to use and <laughs> leverage Bitcoin. And, you know, the next four, eight years is going to be the continued develop of uh, the, the continued development of a Bitcoin network. And people are going to be understanding and seeing the value of Bitcoin as collateral and the ability um, for it to transform a balance sheet uh, just by holding the asset. So. Incredibly bullish. Uh, I mean, keep talking about it. Uh, have conversations. The conversations are valuable, and this they stimulate conversation. Um, you know, with people that run corporations and, and thinking about the positivity of you know having a small allocation of Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Y- you don't have to be scared to do it. MicroStrategy is ninety nine percent Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Um, you wouldn't be the first one. Uh, there's other companies out there. And I, I think, you know, this is all positive development for, you know, corporate adoption of Bitcoin. You know, the maxis will say it's a bad idea, but like corporate adoption is necessary for, uh, for Bitcoin, like hyper Bitcoinization. You need corporations to adopt a Bitcoin strategy without it. Like what, like what is the economy like, if there's no businesses? So, um, yeah, so we got the topics here. Big shout out to the MSTR group. Uh, Ryan already hit on that. We're going to go through valuation. I'm going to talk about Apple Moment, um, you know, comparison to Tesla, and then price and search interest correlation. So I'm going to jump right into it. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. <laughs> so check this out. This is a this is a fun one. I wanted to start with a little bit of a comparison of IBIT uh, from the release date. So this is BlackRock's Bitcoin uh, ETF. Uh, since January 11th, 2024 to October 5th, 2020, 2024. Is that today? October 5th. Uh, and then we compare that to MicroStrategy. So MicroStrategy since January 11th is up 212%. IBIT is up 26%. And I, I think it's pretty pretty astonishing when you look at this comparison, right? The um, the value of MicroStrategy. People are, are recognizing the value of MicroStrategy with uh, all of the positive um, catalysts with the, you know, micro strategy isn't a commodity, right? It's a cash flow. It's a cash flowing enterprise, um, that's included in market cap weighted index funds. Like this isn't copper, right? We're not investing in copper here. It's not a copper fund. Um, it is a company with cash flow that has the ability to grow beyond, um, just investing in a single commodity like what IBIT's doing. So, I mean, just that concept and that fact alone is, uh, you know, why there's out, outsized performance from a company like MicroStrategy over a commodity fund like IBIT. So I think that dovetails right quite nicely into jumping into, again, the multiple assessments. So this is a, a bit of a repeat from Quant Bros episode seven and a half. So apologies for those that have watched this already. You may be able to, you know, breeze through this. Um, but, you know, in looking at the screen here, this is a comparison of the top 20 U.S. equities. And the purpose of showing this, particularly looking at the P.E. ratio or the multiple and net asset value or book value, you can see that there's no homogenous way to compare any of these top equities. You, you've got completely different types of assets. You've got Apple, you've got Amazon, you've got Tesla, you've got J.P. Morgan, you've got oil or Exxon Mobil. So you've got oil companies, you've got banking companies, you've got car manufacturers, you've got tech companies. How do you compare them? They all have different types of assets. They're all structured differently. They're all different types of corporations. And ultimately, there's some component of, um, you know, is Exxon worth more than Apple? Do you think Exxon's worth more than Apple? And, and I think, you know, when these, when these companies get up to the, the upper rankings, there's this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy where the comparison is really on a market cap basis. And, you know, the market is telling us that data and technology is worth more than oil, which is different from how the stock market used to be structured. 15, 20 years ago, oil companies were at the top of the list. Now we've got tech companies that are at the top of the list. So 
you know, what is an equity? Equities are, um, you know, a, an ownership stake in the company. Um, and equities are all forward looking. So when you look at just the PE ratios of these companies, for example, like looking at Apple, Apple's trading at a 34 times PE ratio. So uh, the, the price of the stock is 34 times greater than the earnings. So that implies that the stock is trading at a forward looking valuation of what the earnings would be at some point in the future. So when taking the same framework and you're thinking about like what a, what a stock is, is worth in the future, um, looking at a company like MicroStrategy is incredibly um, empowering, right? Uh, this, is a, this is your Apple moment. Um, and what I mean by that is everybody has that relative. I know everybody that's listening to this has that relative that says, oh, I, I had a chance to buy Apple in 1996 for 30 cents. And then the story ends up going, they didn't buy it and they would be a you know, multimillionaire if they would have bought it in 1996. Reality is, if, even if they would have bought it, like many of you talk about in this community, <laughs> they probably would have sold it. Um, holding it from 1996, they probably would have sold it in 2002. And they would have been like, whoa, great gain, without recognizing that the price of Apple um, in 1997, the valuation of Apple was $2 billion. Today, the valuation of Apple is what? 3.7 trillion. 3.7 trillion. That's a thousand X. You'd be, you know, every, everybody that had that opportunity to buy Apple in 1997, they're kicking themselves for not holding on to their Apple shares for 26 years and getting a thousand X return. This is everybody's Apple moment. You know, where is Bitcoin in its adoption history? We're at less than 1% of global assets, right? Like this is uh, the, the, <laughs> the future for Bitcoin adoption is the, the potential is astronomical if it's being adopted by corporations, um, pension funds, insurance companies, used as collateral. Like the, the future development of this asset, uh, digital money, is astronomical. And the this is your this is my owning micro strategy is like this Apple moment in 1997. So you know when people say, um, and you know what I think it might be helpful to go to this summary summary table. So. This is a summary table of uh, the multiple on net asset value, looking at what the price of MicroStrategy could go to at these different Bitcoin prices um, with different multiple on net asset values, so like, you know, a forward looking multiple, right? MicroStrategy has got 252,000 Bitcoin. Uh, the price of Bitcoin is 61,991. Um, their assets is 15.6 billion. The liabilities are 4.2 billion. Net assets, book value, 11.6 billion. 202 million shares outstanding. There is some accretive dilution potential here, but I'll, I'll let other people talk about that um, in the comments and argue uh, argue about that. Um, but uh, so the reason I point this out is, you know, looking at where the price of MicroStrategy can go, I, I think thinking about net asset value, we could see, let's go back to the multiple. Look at some of these other companies and how forward looking that they're trading. You've got companies like Home Depot trading at 92 times uh, net asset value. You've got companies like, what is this? Eli Lilly trading at 62 times net asset value. There are some that are trading much lower like JP Morgan, denominated in fiat, JP Morgan. Um, and then what is this? Exxon Mobil. I think that, you know, <laughs> there's, some, there's some challenges with the perspective on oil in the future. You've got Berkshire Hathaway trading low which is a effect, this is basically an ETF of a conglomerate of 15 different companies. Um, but all of these other companies that are trading at, you know, significant multiples of net asset value, they have technological capabilities and technological moats. And, you know, using the same framework um, with MicroStrategy holding the best asset on the planet, we can see a, this, a, a very fast move a very fast move in the price of Bitcoin and a very fast move in the price of MicroStrategy. If, if we see the price of Bitcoin go from 80,000 to 150,000 in two months, it is going to be a complete frenzy, complete frenzy of everybody trying to figure out what MicroStrategy is valued at. Nobody's going to, nobody's going to have any idea. They're going to be people that are selling shares left and right because they have no idea what the company's worth. And then all of a sudden, like, 
we may be looking at thousand dollar micro strategy shares, two thousand dollar micro strategy shares, and it's because there will be a frenzy of index ETFs that are following the market cap weighted index funds. They're purchasing. They're agnostic. You're going to have traditional finance that's coming onto the scene, going, "Holy crap! A thirty billion dollar company has how much Bitcoin?" And then you know they're going to be jumping in, um, and there's going to be massive interest uh, beyond this. You know, six thousand. Uh, person irresponsibly long micro strategy group, right? Like, <laughs> you know, um, during the GameStop frenzy in January of 21, uh, Wall Street bets, um, I was following Wall Street bets on Reddit. There were 600,000 people on Wall Street bets. In the course of a week, Wall Street bets went from 600,000 people to 10 million people in a week. So, I mean, <laughs> we are we are so early. There's a jet flying over my head. Oh, it's crazy. Jet City, I guess. Can you hear that? Oh my God! It's Sailor flying by. Sailor is just doing a flyby. That's crazy. Um, okay, so I want to focus really on the, the market cap component here, right? So, um, the market cap of of this company can can change very quickly, and it can compound very quickly. Um, again, if the price of Bitcoin starts to run away, people are going to try to rationalize what this looks like. And you can see there, there's potential for valuations, even at these like crazy multiples. Um, let's say Bitcoin goes to $250,000 at a 35 times multiple. MicroStrategy is still not even the largest company in the stock market at that point. And, you know, there's a trillion dollars to go. <laughs> so, like... Is it possible? Yeah. May, may it be a low probability? Sure. But, you know, looking at other, uh, you know, frenzy like uh, stock movements like GameStop or looking back at um, Volkswagen in 2008, there was a Volkswagen stock squeeze in which Volkswagen at one point was the most valuable company in the entire market. Now, that only lasted like a couple of days or a week, but it still happened. Um, and then there was kind of, uh, you know, reevaluation. We've got a very different scenario here. Like there's no precedent for this. Um, you know, we've got, uh, Ryan's going to share a little bit of detail about Tesla, but there's no precedent. There's no historical precedent for any company converting their cash to, uh, their cash balance sheet to a stronger asset. Like, you know, this is, this is maybe like, um, I don't know, like the Roman Empire before the Roman Empire was big, like hoarding all the gold or something like, you know, I don't think there's any direct comparison uh, in, in history. So the, so taking a traditional framework to quantify what the company is worth, there's no direct comparison to do that. So, you know, I would caution everybody to... <laughs> Think about the probabilities and the possibilities of stock price. Don't just pick a number because it seems high. Like $1,000 seems high, but $1,000 is only a $200 billion market cap for MicroStrategy. You still, like, if you think they're going to be the number one company in the entire market, you've got still a, a 15x. <laughs> um, and in the meantime, you've got the M2 money supply still compounding at 6.5% compound annual growth rate. So, you know, 10 years from now, we could be looking at a $10 trillion company um, given, you know, the, the financial strength and their ability to continue their financial strength into the future. So, you know, a lot of people have asked, you know, what about when the market has a downturn? Um, and that, I think that's a, I think that's a fair question. However, um, <laughs> I think people are, are taking a very long view on this. Like if the market has a downturn, that seems like a great time to accumulate more shares. Um, and, you know, it, <laughs> if you're taking a long view, you know, pending black swan happens, right? If you're taking a long view on this trade, I wouldn't be worried about a market downturn. Um, I would maybe, you know, scrape some profit at the top if you need it to improve your lifestyle or improve your life or whatever. But I wouldn't exit this trade completely at all. And I wouldn't necessarily try to trade based on net asset value, which is a, a number that is really kind of made up uh, to compare equities, right? Like, let's go back to the other ones. What if what if you traded any of these on net asset value? What if you sold an NVIDIA at 3x net asset value, and then it goes to 50? 
you, you'd probably be kicking yourself and saying you're an idiot. So I caution people to use net asset value. It's a fun metric, um, but it could get crazy. I would anticipate it gets crazy. Q4 is going to be absolutely bonkers. 2025 is going to be bonkers. We've got an election coming up. Two more Fed meetings. We got one in November, one in December. Potential, you know, uh, 100 basis point reduction in interest rates uh, through through Q4. Crazy election, um, and yeah, it's it's going to be nuts. It's going to be fucking crazy. <laughs> you know, go ahead, Ryan. Mind if I hop in here? Um, yeah. A few things you were on a roll, so I just, I just want to let you go. <laughs> Feeling it, man. That's the orange tie power. <laughs> and if, if, if I may, I don't want to get too carried away here, but perhaps I don't think we've ever been more back than we are right here, right this moment. So I'm, feel, I'm feeling the same energy you're feeling. Um, yeah, just a couple quick things to, to touch on in that. You had said what happens in the event of a market downturn. When we think that, <clears throat> when we think about the Apple, you know, price and market cap trajectory over the over the past 20 or 25 or so years, it has been, it has not been a smooth ride, right? And I, I, I think a lot of us um, put too much effort and emphasis into thinking about all of the things that can go wrong instead of thinking about all of the things that can go right. And is, are there things that keep me up at night? Yeah, you betcha. Israel, Iran, the Ukraine, um, the changing world order, you know what I mean? The, the dollar debasement, like, yeah, of course, there's, there's things that are going to keep me up at night. But every other entity on earth, every fake crypto meme coin, gold, bonds, real estate, equities, we're all in this together in a sense because everything's going to be impacted. Um, in the in the event of a downturn, and on the Apple piece there, like what happened between the points in time that Jeff referenced of Steve Jobs coming back in September of 1997 at a two point something billion dollar market cap, and today over a thousand x you know increase. What happened during that period of time? Well, I'll tell you, the dot com bubble, including you know a 95 percent drawdown in the Nasdaq 100, the QQQs. Um, what else happened? 9-11. What else happened? A ton of new wars. Like, too many wars to even keep count on. And I'm not just talking about Iraq, Afghanistan, like the ones that people know about, but that there's always proxy wars being fought in Africa. The more special operations veterans you talk to, they, they'll be like, yeah, we were, you know, battling with dudes from some other country. We didn't even know who they are. There's nonstop warfare. There's the dot-com bubble. There's the 2008 global financial crisis, which I think was the, the worst of the bunch because, you know, the fear was the VIX being a 96. Like, that was the level of fear regarding, like, is the bank going to be stable? I think there's a situation if TARP had not been passed or if other key sources of funding had not come to fruition in a relatively quick period of time, we could have been looking at a VIX 200 scenario with the horror of a potential collapse of the fiat system in general, not just the banks, but all faith and trust in, in fiat currencies collapse. And again, what happened during that whole, all of the horrific things I just listed off? Apple went up by more than a factor of a thousand. Right? And there's many people who sold the stock way too soon or they tried to get cute with trading in and out. Um, and that that just that that just almost never works if you're talking about assets that move in a in a nonlinear way. And this came up on a on a space the other day where people were talking, you know, assuming that Bitcoin cycle theory and the Bitcoin election cycle theory like goes to fruition and we're looking at a top my guess would be like Thanksgiving of, of next year, about one year from now, 13 months or so. That's a huge assumption in and of itself that that's even gonna happen or not happen. Plus, people were saying like, they know I deal in options, so I'll have something to realize, but people are saying, don't you wanna trim the stock up there as well? Well, probably not, right? Because if MicroStrategy gets to, let's say, 1200 bucks a share or something like that, it could be higher, it could be lower, who knows? But if it gets to $1,200 a share and it gets more than cut in half and it goes to, let's say, 400 or something like that, or even 300 that that price point of 300 is still going to be 
higher than my cost basis by like a factor of six or seven at like a $49 or $50 cost basis. So I'd still have to be paying a much higher higher price in the future, even if there is a big drawdown. Um, yeah, and I, I just hit, I'll just touch on that too. I mean, let's game theory this out, right? Like let's say the price of Bitcoin goes to 150,000 and the stock goes to, you know, $1,335 and you sell. And then the price of Bitcoin goes to 500,000 and you're wrong. Right. You just you just miss it like you're wrong, and then that that in, that encourages additional compounding on market cap, and you know the the price goes to seven thousand, right? And that's a possibility, like that's a scenario, and you know sure may may there be a bear market and it draws down and maybe yeah maybe it goes to two thousand, um, or maybe it goes to twenty two hundred. You're still like you still missed a hundred percent gain. <laughs> like a doubling. Um, so it's going to be impossible to, it's going to be really hard. No, it's going to be impossible to time the top, right? Like if uh, there's a couple ways to look at this, you could be buying the, buying the top forever, like Michael Saylor. Um, and you could take the perspective that in the future, there will be, um, you know, ways to leverage your portfolio, um, to generate cash flow and live your life. For example, the buy, borrow, die strategy, where you can take an, a loan out on the, the assets that you hold in your portfolio, or options like CMSTR, tokenized MSTR, where you can actually utilize your stock uh, as opposed to just having it sit in a brokerage account. So, you know, there's there's a future where you, you wouldn't necessarily have to sell these assets too. So um, I'm bullish on that outlook as well. Uh, so the concept of a drawdown, maybe it's my horizon, right? Like um, I'm not Doc Kruger. I've got a 60 year horizon left. Um, and, you know, like maybe I think a little bit differently, but knowing knowing all of the players in the market and how they think, that should influence your decision making today. Um, and that's like the concept of game theory. And it, it's it's useful to think about the probabilities and the possibilities and to, like assign your own perspective and strategy on how to trade the stock. So um, for me, I'm irresponsibly long. <laughs> and people can interpret that however they want, but um, I'm very long. I, I take a very long view of this company. Yeah, and I think um, the last thing there on that, by the way, I agree with everything you said. And I, I think the last point there with the Apple story is really taking a closer look at the competitive dynamics between Apple and Microsoft and IBM and Sun Microsystems and Radio Shack and, and all these players in the marketplace, right? You can go back and watch Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, like old videos, and it, it's very interesting how they talk about the tough times when they were battling it out and, and also when you know Bill Gates came in and, and invested into Apple with, with Microsoft's funds and there was a partnership there, but it was, it was a real battle, man, you know what I mean? But now we fast forward today, we look at something like MicroStrategy. I mean, MSTR has more Bitcoin than any country on earth. It has more than, it has 2.2x as much Bitcoin as every other global public company combined. And that kind of takes me back to this, you know, this hyper fixation on the, on the 1x MNAV. And by the way, the thing I meant to say earlier was a lot of what Jeff had just laid out comes back to that that first question that Jeff asked on Quant Bros episode one, which is how do you value any one equity? We could poke holes in any of this stuff on it, on any of that that's on the table right here, like Broadcom, Amazon, Alphabet, Nvidia, Apple, Microsoft, Exxon Mobil. Jeff touched on that piece about how the demand for oil competing against you know clean energy and how there's the battle there. I don't see that battle existing with with micro strategy. And, you know, Jeff put Jeff put the the chart up of uh, you know micro strategy versus IBIT since uh, since inception. So basically, all of this year, and I mean, this is just this is like a level of statistical dominance that I think is really significant, both in absolute terms and also in the risk adjusted returns number. If I don't end up sharing that little data table, I'll throw it in the uh, I'll throw it in the comments. But I mean, micro strategy is doubling. IBIT in, in risk-adjusted returns, and we're seeing frequently that it, that MSTR is going down less than IBIT on, on certain down days. Not every day, but enough observations to make it something that's um, 
significantly worth it. And um, yeah, but other than that, the BlackRock I did, like, I almost don't even know who that is. You know what I mean? And I'm, I'm so locked in on the, uh, like, giving the finger to BlackRock, like the Steve Jobs <laughs> picture. Because I do think we're at a very interesting David and Goliath story, and we're going to get in, into that kind of stuff more. But I mean, MicroStrategy has won the Bitcoin equity race in terms of performance, both in absolute terms and risk-adjusted returns. And it's my belief that that's, that's going to continue. Yeah, 100% agree. 100% agree. It is the fastest horse. It is the most volatile. I mean, and there's been a lot of talk about, ooh, you know, I bet options are coming out. Ooh. <laughs> They're not going to be more volatile than, uh, than MicroStrategy. Like, there's still going to be an incredible demand for options on MicroStrategy compared to iBit. I, I mean, people think that like all of these options are going to be sold and, and then <laughs> they'll flip over to iBit. I really don't think that's the case. I mean, it's, it's such a, it's such a more lucrative upside, which is crazy because like the hurdle rate is Bitcoin, right? Like you gotta, you gotta beat the, the return of Bitcoin. Now you got Bitcoin plus. And uh, I mean, there's a possibility somebody catches them, I guess, meta, maybe. Um, it, but I think it's incredibly, incredibly low, especially, I mean, we've got, uh, you know, MicroStrategy had a $2 billion at the market capital raise, right? So they sold $2 billion of shares starting on August 1st. And the price of the stock still went up. There was dilution. There was dilution. And the price of the stock still went up more than IBIT has gone up, which is insane. $2 billion of dilution. And so that's the that's a representative of this kind of like accretive dilution, right? And it shows, you know, how compressed the float and the volume of shares is when you're raising two billion dollars of capital <laughs> off your share price, and the price still goes up. Um, and w there's nine hundred million dollars left on on the uh, on the capital raise. I suspect that they've been, you know, selling the stock over time, all of uh, all of September, um, even a. I think within the next 15 days, they will announce that they bought another 14,000 Bitcoin, uh, $900 million ATM is tapped. They may wait until the election. Uh, the Q3 earnings release is on November 6th. So it's the day after the election. That could be crazy. <laughs> that could be crazy. Um, it's, uh, you know, that could be the gun, the gun going off. Um, who knows? We will see. Um, but, you know, incredibly exciting time, right? MicroStrategy hit an, a market cap all-time high. People were questioning me in the comments here, but um, it hasn't hit a price all-time high. Price all-time high was still back in March. Um, however, there's been dilution, but the dilution has been accretive because it's actually added Bitcoin per share for MicroStrategy. And with the dilution, that means there's more shares. So what is the value of a company? The value of a company is the price of the stock trading at the margin multiplied by all the shares outstanding. So now that there are more shares, the market cap of the company is higher. And that's why we're hitting a market cap all-time high, but not necessarily a price all-time high. I wouldn't be concerned about that. That's actually incredibly bullish because the market cap weighted indices, that means as the market cap's going up, you have, you have an exponential um, allocation to all of the market cap weighted indices that that MSDR is included in. They're already included in a ton of these indices, and it's it the addition, the potential addition of QQQ and S and P five hundred is only accretive. Like th this this relationship is going to exist into perpetuity, even if they don't get included in QQQ or S and P five hundred. Like yeah, I guess there's a chance that that doesn't happen, but. Even if it doesn't, I don't care. I'm not selling my MicroStrategy shares because they're already included in market cap weighted indices with Bitcoin as the um, really the like the nuclear core that keeps it going up. Um, so, yeah, super bullish. Um, you know, Michael Saylor's also brought up this. Uh, we are on the we are on the gold rush um, over the next eight years. So each one of these dots, as you can see on the screen, is another halving event. Um, so you, this is the this is the supply curve of Bitcoin, and um, you know I think he mentions 2032 being the end of the gold rush, where you got one percent of Bitcoin left to mine over the next 100 years. You can kind of see that in this graph here. So yeah, like we're going to see volatility for the next eight years for sure, but it's going to be a lot of competition to get those remaining Bitcoin um, before we get to this kind of 99 percent of Bitcoin mined in 2032. So just something to be aware of. Um, 
Yeah, go ahead, Ryan. I hop in here just to, you know, kind of in a friendly way, stick the pitchfork into eye bit a little bit more. I don't, I don't, I don't, <laughs> Get I don't, him. I don't want to lose sight. I don't want to lose sight of that. But all the stuff that me, Ben, Jeff, like the whole crew talks about catalyst wise that we see from micro strategy, none of this stuff applies to eye bit. Right, they're not going into the Nasdaq QQQ 100 um, index. They're not going into the S and P. They're not going to benefit at all from the change to FASB fair value accounting. They're not going in the all country world index. They don't have Michael Saylor. Like there's there's and we're going to touch on that a little bit more. But there's so many constants and catalysts that are not applicable to IBIT and really only applicable to MSDR with it with their monopoly position in Bitcoin, like they're going to benefit the most. And I, I think, again, just to come one last thing on the um, this perception of a 1x MNAV, th that's what people should be saying about IBIT. You know what I mean? That's what I'm saying about IBIT. There's no reason for that equity to ever trade above or below net asset value, assuming everything just kind of goes along as it does, price-wise and mechanics and all that other stuff. Um, but there's a, a, a really clear and concise and long-winded, long-worded case as to why MSTR could, should, and perhaps will trade at a significantly higher MNAV. And we also don't necessarily think that it's going to be like this linear or like gradual movement. I think the case could be made that you know MNAV is going to move around at probably 70 to 80 percent of the volatility that MSTR stock is going to. So yeah, let me uh, let, let me pass it back to Jeff here. But sometimes you just gotta, you know, put the pitch. <laughs> get, get him. Get him. No, I think that's a good transition. Um, getting into Tesla and thinking about, you know, um, Larry Fink's not memefied. Right. No, nobody's making AI images of Larry Fink. If they are, it's Michael Saylor's like sitting on them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Micro strategy is about to pass BlackRock in their in their holdings. I, I mean that that's that's a possibility. Um, and if they continue operating um, and getting included in these indices and have the continued financial strength, I mean it just gets it just gets even crazier. Um, so you know I'll pass I'll pass the screen share over to you, Ryan. You could go from there. But yeah, so before I go into the into the Tesla thing, the thought I had there on the potential BlackRock flippening, I see two flippings potentially on the horizon with BlackRock, both in you know terms of their Bitcoin holdings. I know we're starting to get within that range. I don't I don't have the exact number on me, but I think they have somewhere on the order of three hundred and twenty to three hundred and fifty thousand Bitcoin. Um, and I don't think they're acquiring, I don't think they're going to end up acquiring at the same Bitcoin acquisition per day that MicroStrategy will, and a lot of that's because of the incentives and other things. But the other flipping that could happen with BlackRock, and I think it'll happen this cycle. I could easily be wrong on this, by the way, but I think you know MicroStrategy is going to flip BlackRock in market cap, and also potentially the Bitcoin stack um, in this cycle. And it, Anything else from you, Jeff? And then I'll get into this. No, um, I was going to look up Black BlackRock assets under management are nine trillion, nine point one trillion. Right. Okay, so let's think about that. Nine point one trillion, and they're they're earning a, an expense ratio fee for like these assets under management, right? And BlackRock's valuations were they on that that tab? I, I think their valuation is like six hundred billion. No, 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 no. It's, no, um, am I not? Am I wrong? It's it's in the ballpark of like one fifty to one eighty. I think it's oh, also okay. going to go up as micro strategy goes up. So it's not like a static target, but it's it's sub two hundred billion. Oh, 151 billion. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, good call. Um, okay, right. So they're holding nine trillion of assets, um, and they're earning for expense other, ratio for other, for other people, people. For other people. Yeah, um, and they're earning expense ratios on those nine trillion. So. I mean, less than 1%. It's probably a quarter of a point, maybe. Um, so that's 90 billion ish if it's one point. That's uh, 15 billion if it's a quarter of a point, something like that. So, yeah, I, I think that flipping is very possible, very likely, actually. Very, very likely, actually. Um, Keep going. Sorry to derail. Yeah, and no, no, you're fine. And the um, the key distinction that you touched on, which is worth repeating, is that um, 
when I'm talking about BlackRock's market cap, I'm of course talking about that $151 billion number and not the, the 10 trillion assets under management. But I think that there's an interesting takeaway from that, right, is that, you know, BlackRock really doesn't own anything. BlackRock really doesn't, like, take any, like, directional-based market risk. They're really just profiting from, like, the bid-ask spreads or what Jeff was saying about, about the expense fees. No, probably less or so on the bid-ask spreads, but just the expense fees, which, by the way, you have to pay to own iBid. You don't have to pay to own MSTR. But that's... BlackRock sees more of like a custodian, almost in the way that a bank will custody your cash assets. BlackRock will custody like your ETF assets and and things like that. But yeah, big big distinction between market cap and uh, AUM. But um, to keep thing to keep things uh, moving right along here with with what we think could potentially be a Tesla 2019 moment for for micro strategy this year. And I know ADQ, ADIQ mindset's already going to be in the comments, you know, after this gets posted saying like, no, it's more like 2012, uh, 2012 for Tesla. And I get what he's saying in terms of like being early and also like key inflection points in the market cap and like Tesla, Tesla's early profitability that didn't really push them through until 2019, 2020, when the Model 3 ramp was complete, the Model Y, the, the ramping of the Model Y, like we can see the light at the end of the tunnel there, plus mega packs were just crushing everyone's expectations in terms of gross margin um, and things like that. But yeah, let me, let me take a step back and look at, I wanna talk about four main similarities from Tesla in 2019 and 2020 and how it's very similar to what I think MicroStrategy has right now for the next couple of years. Um, and and some, of these, some, of these, some of these items on the list will of course last much longer. Like number one, there is a real cult-like following around visionaries and specifically visionaries who have a ton of skin in the game, meaning they own a lot of the stock and they're, they're also a shareholder. Like Sailor says, like, you know, our shareholders want Bitcoin, our shareholders want more Bitcoin per share. He can theoretically include himself in that because he is one of the shareholders. And I think that for me is like the first filter immediately if I'm going to invest in, in an equity or not. Is I want it to be like a founder still involved and I want them to own a ton of stock. If, if those two things aren't met, I don't even look any further whatsoever. So for me, I know that means a lot. And Jeff talked about earlier, like the rapid expansion um, potential for something like the irresponsibly long micro strategy group, where it could go up by a factor of 10 or 20 or 30 in like a very short period of time. Plus then you sprinkle in the, um, the Discord, the MSTR den, there's a real reflexivity there just by having so many people talking about it, both bulls and bears, and then the bulls correct the bears and the bears correct the bulls, but it just keeps on going. So I don't really need to touch on that one too much more. There, there's a clear cult like following around guys like Sailor and Elon, and I think it's a massively beneficial thing. So when people would say to me, you know, if I was talking about Tesla or, you know, micro strategy, you often get called like a fanboy or you're in a cult as if that's a bad thing. I think it's a great thing. <laughs> so that's, for stocks, yes. <laughs> for stocks, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. We're all in the, we're all going the same direction. You know, it's not like we're not, we're not against each other here. So that's number one. And I think that's probably the easiest one to understand. Number two there was a massive jump in profitability for both Tesla with their Model 3, Model Y, Mega Pack rollout, what I was just talking about a minute ago, and micro strategy in terms of uh, their switch to FASB fair value accounting. Number three, there was an inclusion into the S&P 500 at a relatively high market cap for Tesla and perhaps with MSTR, right? Especially if certain things start falling into place at the right time, being included into the NASDAQ 100. Um, I saw Taylor, uh, Taylor Kenneth, he posted that the ACW, ACWI rebalancing is looking like November 26th. Of course, MicroStrategy has gone up in that period, so there's going to be more purchases there. Then FASB, then S&P 500 is hopefully like the, the grand finale for our catalyst for just this cycle alone. 
Um, and of course, there's there's a similarity there with Tesla, where I, I think, I don't know off the top of my head, but I think they were perhaps the largest market cap company to be entering the S&P 500 yes. at that point in time. Yeah, I mean, it was yeah. hundreds of billions of dollars. 300, 300 billion, 300 billion. Right, and they're, they're normally in sooner, like the, the relevant yeah. stocks. There was, of course, a profitability thing, which we're going to talk about here in a minute, that, that held yeah. back for a certain period. So, so in my opinion, this is really like Tesla 2013 and 2020 combined. Because so when Tesla was added to QQQ in 2013, in July of 2013, the stock went from $4 billion market cap to a $24 billion market cap in like five months. And so that's what 5x, right? So that, that, that happened 5x with a company that wasn't profitable, with like no clear idea to when they would be profitable. Turns out they weren't profitable for another seven years. You know, <laughs> like that's uh, th that's when they got inclu uh, included in the S&P 500 um, is once they hit the profitability threshold. Now you're looking at MicroStrategy, not currently included in QQQ, um, and they're actually incredibly profitable but from an accounting perspective it doesn't look like they're profitable because of the the, the dated accounting rules they're sitting on a six billion dollar gain <laughs> that's going to flow through the accounting and so now you've got like both of these compounders happening at the same time yeah i mean the that that big move up for Tesla in 2013 was just the success of seeing the Model S be rolled out, right? Because one quick thing about the car industry that I've learned over the years, and I'm no expert on like the auto business or anything, but you have to be on one of the extremes. You have to either be like Toyota and Honda and sell a ton of cars low volume, or you have to be Ferrari and sell very expensive cars but low volume. The middle is an absolute purgatory from hell. Like your Mercedes Benz, BMW, Lincoln, try, Lincoln, trying to sell. I think that's Ford. Ford Lincoln. Ford Lincoln. Yeah, Ford Lincoln. Um, but trying to sell a car for a hundred thousand dollars is the absolute worst business. Perhaps it has to be cheap and high volume, or expensive and low volume. And being able to see the progression from, you know, the Roadster which they sold almost no units to then Model S gave, gave a belief that like, okay, we're going to get to Model 3, Model Y, and like get an even more affordable car from that. But you're right. I mean, the, uh, the profitability was not there at the time. And it was far off in the future. It was just like totally uncertain, you know? Six, seven years afterwards. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, I mean, part of that might have been in – that was probably an accounting um, – that was probably they were probably taking the Amazon playbook, I would assume, where they actually had profitability, but they were they were rolling it into R and D, so it looks like they weren't profitable. So similar thing happened to Amazon. So Amazon, a lot of people gave Amazon shit because you know they were becoming pervasive. Everybody was starting to use Amazon. It was everywhere. You can get anything on Amazon. Went from a bookstore to buy everything. But if you looked at their accounting and you looked at their earnings, their earnings were actually really poor. Um, they they weren't showing a net income. Uh, in fact, I think it was negative net income for many, many years in a row. However, the reason it was negative is they were rolling their net income into research and development, which, you know, the way it worked in the accounting basis, it flowed through, it basically took out of the net income and it showed a negative earnings, um, despite them garnering massive market share from companies like Target and Walgreens and, you know, all of these other things. So pretty interesting correlations there. Yeah, that um, that that Bill Miller story. I think Preston Pish retold it. That's that's where I heard it from. Where he just knew he was holding the winner. Uh, Bill Miller knew he could, you know, emplace his trust in, into Jeff Bezos. But there was also that very specific accounting thing where he had a real information asymmetry about like, no, this is profit, but they're just taking such a long term view that it's not going to be realized until until some point into the future. Um. And then with this, the, the fourth similarity that I'm going to touch on is the call skew. Um, and I know people tend to call this, I call it, they, they tend to reference this through different names. Typically the word skew is, is always in there. And what we're looking at there is what is the price of out of the money options, right? Both calls and puts. We look at the equidistant calls and puts, meaning like 10 or 20% out of the money all the way up to like 80% out of the money and see the price, you know, the spread on those prices between calls and puts. 
and the bottom line up front on this is that you know both Tesla and MSTR had massive positive skew on the call side, where the calls were just so much more than um, than the puts, and that, that's very that's extremely indicative of setups that have what we would refer to as a gamma squeeze, um, and this is just one of the. I would say upstream ways of, of identifying that is, is through the call skew. Um, so just to j just to paint the picture here, and also to give a to give a shout out to to uh, another special contributor on on Twitter, um, just to come back to the cult like followings you know around visionaries with skin in the game. There's a real phenomenon happening here, you know, and me and Grain of Salt, we were talking about this where he thinks like there should be one point of MNAV just for sailor alone. Like that's the sailor premium. I think that number should be something more <laughs> two, or <three>. two or <laughs> three or four for just sailor premium yeah. alone. And even people like Doc Kruger, our boy, has said on a space, you know, we could not have a better um liaison for Bitcoin or spokesperson for Bitcoin is what he said. So even him being like tilted, like kind of mostly bearish MSTR or just not taking the journey the way you and I are in terms of allocation, um, it's, it's, it's still funny that, that he recognizes that as well. And just to finish up my uh, LaDozier piece here, you go to LaDozier's page, you get this website right here. I mean, there is just so much. <laughs> <laughs> These are amazing. Oh my God. And it's going to take over AI. I mean, AI is going to capture this and then all of a sudden Sailor's going to be infiltrated into all of the AI image generation. Oh my God. And these are oh, the hippo. I mean, these, <laughs> these here are like the, the oh, it's so good. LLM generated picture I've ever seen. <laughs> I don't even want to ask how the Dozer does it. Just it's to like, secret just sauce, respect, dude. Just to respect the magician yeah. work, but, but I mean, it's remarkable. And again, <laughs> you know, I remind us all that they're not doing this for Larry Fink and BlackRock and Ibit. They're doing it for like the guy who's extremely compelling. He's one of the most well-read people I've, I've ever heard. And Grain of Salt said this to me at MSTR World, you know. It's just a master class in how he can go from finance to engineering to history spanning back thousands of years and really paint this this broader picture. So, shout out to LaDozier. I mean, this is this this is really awesome stuff and it's, um, it's exciting to be a part of. Um... But now I can't remember the Discord, the dogs, like, looking at us, like, <laughs> listen to these idiots. Um, and then my, my next thing I want to I wanna jump to here, it's, it's all still about Tesla. When we look at number two, the massive jump in profitability for both Tesla and MSTR, I mean, this is, this, this is like a really, really compelling setup that we're looking at. And this also, of course, ties into the point I'm going to make here about the S&P 500 and having such a large market cap be entering. Um, to one of Jeff's earlier points, markets are, of course, forward-looking. And I almost wish I had the price overlaid here because the price was just vertical at this point, like somewhat before um, Tesla's net income had started to rip. And forgive me, I should have you know introduced this chart a little bit better, but we get the micro strategy net income quarterly in purple, and then we got the Tesla net income quarterly in the teal blue here. And I know uh, Ben always likes to like one of his things is he's a big free cash flow guy. I like net income because I think of that as like the bottom most bottom line net of everything else. So you could use free cash flow, someone could use earnings, or there's there's other ways of like getting to this same kind of kind of conclusion here. But this this arrow right here, that's when Tesla had made the black arrow, I'm sorry, is when Tesla had met all of the conditions required for joining the S P five hundred. And really the only one that they were missing was the profitability of, you know, four quarters summed together. And they first got this right here, and then they were included into the S&P shortly after. Now, where this comes back to micro strategy is I think that the, the move is going to be perhaps slightly more intense and at a much shorter period of time, right? 
I think micro strategies, you know, net income is going to gap to somewhere in the nine billion dollar range. And I, I could be wrong on this number, but the one that I was referencing or been using, or perhaps I'm reading this wrong, but the FASB gain being nine billion dollars at basically today's Bitcoin price. But if one was to imagine, you know, eighty, ninety, a hundred thousand dollar Bitcoin on March thirty first of two 2025, which all signs are indicating that that's going to be the day where Bitcoin price is marked to market to come up with this this final number. But yeah, just and then here's the the, the more interactive chart where we can move around. But I I think that this purple number is just going to go vertically higher and perhaps overtake the uh, the seven billion of what you know Tesla's setup was. Again, I'm about to I'm about to pass it here to get your feedback on that. But again, let's also bake in the competitive dynamics. There was still Ford, General Motors, Toyota, I think GM and Ford are like horrendously run businesses. They're never gonna pay back their debt. I can't believe anyone owns these things. But still, there is a case to be made that like Tesla was operating in a competitive environment, Mercedes Benz with BMW, with many, many of the car makers. And their their rip to this, you know, almost eight billion dollars that they made in one quarter. I think MSTR is going to do that in you know one one hundredth or one one thousandth of the time because this took you know a year and a half to play out from when they got in the S and P kind of down here in this area to where they got to almost eight billion dollars. I think MicroStrategy is just gapping up to to about that level give or take depending on, on where Bitcoin is. But what are you what are you thinking on that, Jeff? And did I get this this um this math yeah. wrong here? No, no, no. I, th- I think that's I think that's that math's right. Um you know there, I've got a couple thoughts on this. Uh, it's interesting. I, I'm really curious to see actually how it will play out. Um, because I like from an accounting basis because I some of the gain might be added to like retained earnings. Um, fr- from like the at the beginning of the year, and it will only maybe only capture the change during that quarter. But regardless, like that still has got to flow through back to profitability of the historical years. So, uh, from an accounting standpoint, it will be interesting to see exactly how it plays out. The other thing I wanted to point out is nobody knows <laughs> this exists. Like in the traditional finance world, there are very select few that know that this accounting rule. Um, exists right there are a few people i've told it my told about micro strategy and um you know they've come back to me and said wow what are you talking about like the earnings of this company are horrible and yeah i gotta you gotta explain like you know well it's an accounting rule and it's going to be marked to market and they're like wow it seems sketchy what's going to happen is they're going to come out with the fasb fair value accounting they're going to post this enormous gain and the stock price is going to go berserk um as the rest of the world wakes up, right? Like, um, this is going to be on CNBC. This is going to be in the Wall Street Journal. It's going to be on the New York Times. It's going to be on front of Financial Times. It will be in The Economist, right? Like, there's probably going to be a TV show about this. There's going to be a movie. Like, this is, like, totally GameStop worthy. Um, and all of a sudden, the world is going to wake up to the fact that there's this, you know, just f- funky accounting rule that uh, has undervalued the company drastically. And because of that accounting role, they've been able to get their head start that much further, um, that much further than any other company because the rest of the world was asleep to the nuances of um, you know, Bitcoin uh, as an asset on your balance sheet. So, I mean, just that, that concept alone, right? Like that, believe it or not, there are gonna be so many people that are going to they're going to are going to Google Bitcoin for the first time next July, right? Like ninety nine percent of America is going to Google Bitcoin for the first time next July, um, and uh, the, <laughs> yeah, it's just it's crazy to me. I mean, I think that's you know why it's important to talk about these things. It really gives you some perspective of like how the rest of the world may view this or like, you know, it, 
I've, I've spent 10,000 hours plus, you know, researching MicroStrategy and Bitcoin. And, you know, I'm, I, feel, I feel bad a little bit for the people that are going to start their very first hour next July. And they're going to kick themselves for like, well, I should have really researched that back in 2020 when, you know, all this other stuff was happening. Um, and following this company that, you know, has been buying a ton of it. So um, that might be a good uh, correlation or you could draw it. Um, you could pull up the search interest as well, just to show that. I mean, like w w the market cap for MicroStrategy just hit an all-time high, but search interest on MicroStrategy is at like damn near all-time low. Let me bring up the live ones here. Keep going. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's that's pretty much it. Uh, like, um, yeah, it's gonna be crazy. I mean, this this whole this whole situation is gonna be crazy. All right, so you've got this is. MicroStrategy trending now, search interest, MSTR, MicroStrategy, MicroStrategy. Okay, so I don't, I don't know why it's coming in black. Usually the screen turns white, but all the all the that's all right. There. That's all right. So you've got all of these topics here, and this is like a percent of a hundred. So this is zero out of a hundred. So it's um, just to show like the relativities um, in history. So as you can see, it looks like um, basically that March of twenty four when MicroStrategy hit an all-time high on a price perspective. Um, let's throw that one in there too. Yeah, I mean, so you know, when you're looking at this, like the, <laughs> a lot of people Googled MicroStrategy for the first time when they hit an all-time high. Um, and a lot of people bought the peak there. And uh, I, I think they bought the peak and then started learning at what they have. I'm sure some people, I'm sure there's a large cohort, cohort of people that bought the peak there in March and sold because they were nervous and didn't really understand what was going on. Um, and are probably not going to come back for quite a while. But, you know, in, in looking at these trends, we just hit a market cap all time high, but we're at, you know, 10% of what the search interest volume is at. I mean, this is, this is massive consolidation. Like that's what, that's exactly what this is, is just massive consolidation over the last nine months. Um, and just preparing for the next move higher. Um, you know, when Bitcoin does break out of, uh, this, this additional massive consolidation period. Yeah. And, and with that, um, I was telling Jeff I had an issue with my Excel where like my account was terminated from from Rutgers, so I, I ended up losing a bunch of my Excel files. And one of the ones that I wanted to show was where I had lined up all of these search interests because if you just go, oh, see now it's my again. If you just go right here, you can export this stuff, and then it'll the five year view will come out in weekly chunks, like a weekly candle on a chart. So you export this, you export the um, the MSTR price, and then you can you can line them up and you can quantifiably measure the strength of the correlation, which is you know the linear relationship between two or more variables. And the thing that has the highest correlation is um, MSTR's daily uh, dollar liquidity. So you take either the closing price, or I like to do like the average price of that day, and then multiply it by the amount of shares that were traded. And that had a correlation of 0 0.82, or we could just say 82% to kind of keep it easier. That had a positive correlation of 82, and price um, correlated against the search interest with this NASDAQ MSTR one being like the, the highest number. That's in the ballpark of 79 to 80%. So to me, that's very statistically relevant, right? I think of things that are above, you know, 75% or below negative 75%, like the, the extremes on both sides. I think that's very interesting and because, it, because it's very reflective of the, the price movements. The thing that's not interesting though, however, again, I lost this, this Excel file, I'm gonna have to remake it, but I looked at the S&P 500, I looked at Apple, I looked at Home Depot, Lockheed Martin, McDonald's, a nice basket of, of equities, and I plotted them on Y charts with their, uh, with their PE ratio. These things have a correlation of like 10%, 20%, negative 1% which is just so shocking because you turn on CNBC wow. or you listen to 
and I really got to remake this now that I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, that sounds cool. You listen to traditional asset managers, like they always come back to like PE ratio when there's quantifiably multiple different ways of quantifying that there's actually no relationship whatsoever between PE ratio and the the price of the um, the price of the stock. Um, it's just for newspapers. It's just you know people talk about it like it means nothing. PE ratio means absolutely nothing. Nobody cares about it. <laughs> like it don't nobody nobody actually cares about it. Like algorithms and shit. Like I mean maybe it's a function in algorithms uh, that uh, of equities that are trading, but I mean nobody actually cares about like what the PE ratios are. And if they do, they're thirty years behind. And their, their portfolio is probably underperforming, probably the S&P 500, right? Like the, the flow of information and um, these days is just completely different. And I think there's better ways of measuring manias too. Like a while back, I showed the, the dot-com bubble and the NASDAQ 100 was trading at its peak March of 2000. At 380 percent above the 2,000-day moving average, not the 200-day, but the 2,000-day moving average, which rough math comes out to like eight years of trading days, and it was 380 percent above that. I think that's a better way of measuring a media, Jesus, crazy a, a blow-off top or something like that. Plus some of the the variance and implied volatility and volume stuff that we're going to go in. I just think there's much better measurements out there than the PE ratio but just to just to wrap this one up quickly and again what we're looking at here is there's about an 80% correlation between the direction of price and the direction of all of the search interests and all of the search interests blended together since they kind of these these two guys on the top we got US and worldwide it all moves in in one direction and um I, I think this is, is very interesting, not just because of, of how strong the, um, the positive correlation is, but it just gives you a sense of like what the pulse is, you know what I mean? And by the way, these, these hundreds, that this, like this point right here with the green line, that does not imply that that's like a max or a ceiling or anything like that. Because if we just come down here to the post that I did below that, um, when was this? This was January 22nd of 2024. So, like, while we're in the thick of it, like, battling Doc Kruger on the internet and doing the Lord's work of uh, talking about micro strategy, all of the search interest lines, all of them were below what the, uh, the May or June of 2022, like, peak was. Um, and, of course, this thing does work in both directions where the, the massive sell-offs are also going to get the Jim Cramers of the world talking about micro-strategy and that gets people to Google it. But if you see where the search interest was at that time, just take, like, a mental image of this right here and then you go back to the more recent post, it exploded through that, that peak ceiling and pushed that previous peak ceiling right here back to you know about 50% on the US one and maybe something like 60 on the on the worldwide one. So this upper limit's not a ceiling by any means because as new data comes the previous peaks can be pushed downwards. Um, so yeah, I I think this correlation metric is is very interesting especially on the PE comparison where you know PE offers absolutely no like level-based information about where the stock is, I mean, low, high, medium, trending up, trending down. Um, so yeah, that's that piece. So, you got anything else? I, I kind of want to finish up no. that Tesla thing. Yeah, rip it. Um, so where did we leave off? We, we talked about this here pretty good, and here's the retained earnings view if you wanted to look at it as well. Um, you have micro strategy losing almost a, a billion dollars in that quarter in terms of retained earnings. Like that's a function of FASB fair value not being implemented and micro strategy having to mark down their holdings only on the downside but not on the upside. And that's really what the investment opportunity is in the short term is us kind of like with the Bill Miller and Amazon story us having a pretty solid understanding of where 
of where these numbers could go in a, in a short period of time. And I think it's going to be, I think it's going to end up being vertically higher. Um, it might not yeah. take out the, this one of here for Tesla, but on the last one, I, I think it very well may, depending on where the price of Bitcoin is. Yeah, right. Yeah, they're, they're sitting on that gain right now <laughs> with the price of Bitcoin at 62,000. Right? Like, if it goes to 120, I mean, the, 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 the dynamics change rapidly, very quickly. Um, yeah, th th this this is called asymmetric information. Like, you know things like the market. Some people in the market know things that other people in the market don't know. Um, and you can think about like this efficient markets hypothesis where, you know, the concept is um, the stock is always trading at the fair value because of everybody has the same information. This is a very clear asymmetric information trade, like very clear. Um, go walk or go ask 20 people. <laughs> If they've heard of micro strategies, FASB, fair value accounting, go, go ask, like I've asked plenty of people in the financial world and that makes me incredibly bullish on this trade. It's like, I have so much more information than, those, than like <laughs> people that I consider to be like very smart and like good at managing money and they have no, no idea this exists. Yeah, and I, I could even take it a step further if you don't mind. You can go ask a lot of people, both finance people and non-finance people, do you know who Michael Saylor is? And they don't even know that. So, like, the FASB fair value, I feel like it's really just us who knows that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because when you think about the other financial medias, none of them are talking about this on CNBC or Bloomberg. And the stuff that winds up in like seeking alpha is just like your stuff, my stuff, and Ben's stuff all <laughs> tied in a bow. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and and other people, of course. So I really think we like our our group of people who have chosen to come together on this thing have have the best understanding of that. You know. Yeah, um, agreed. To uh, to wrap up the Tesla piece because we had over here number four the um, the call skew. Back to my chart here. Um, I, sh I should have also had the Tesla one up here. I'm going to have to go back to like Thinkorswim and like somehow manually find the prices of, of old options contracts. But I remember that Tesla in 2020 was very similar uh, skew. And just to, just to run through some of the numbers on here, this was a shorter dated. Um, analysis I did of like contracts that were expiring pretty soon. I started there and then did a longer one. So I had kind of the best of both worlds. And um, the 20 to 60% out of the money calls and puts, the ones that are equidistant and the same distance out, were trading at, you know, double to 20 times as much as the puts were. And it gets more intense as you, as you go further out of the money. And then on this, this, uh, the next one I did, which was the longer dated stuff, I was also like very thrilled to see that, you know, 50% out of the money calls or 3x the 50% out of the money puts. And then when you go to 80% out of the money calls are worth 10 times the amount that, you know, the 80% out of the money puts are. And that's where it really gets interesting for me because you would think that there would be a demand from someone in the marketplace to own like convex tail risk. Maybe they don't think, you know, micro strategies going to zero, but like none of us really know anything. So maybe even someone like me or you would want to hedge with that or Michael Saylor or people who have a big allocation to Bitcoin and the IBIT options are not out yet, you know what I mean? So maybe people would have used that as like, okay, I got my Bitcoin on cold storage and I'm gonna hedge this by taking a deep out of the money put. There's really no demand for them relative to the calls. And we don't even need um, you know, volume or open interest on any of these to price them because the price will be determined by the bid ask spread and where buyers come in or don't come in. But we have prices for options that don't even have any, any open interest. And so the, the market has done this, right? The market has said like the, the, the price to pay for long call exposure is gonna be a multiple as expensive as the long put exposure. And again, the reason that this kind of stuff is relevant, the reason that this stuff is relevant 
is because this is a very common characteristic of any gamma squeeze that's ever happened, where there's just such a tilt for long exposure versus you know short exposure through owning puts. Yeah, it's a really interesting dynamic. I think uh, the the other thing Adam Back tweeted this uh, I think today or yesterday. Uh, if you look at uh, the derivatives of Bitcoin um, and the uh, options that you could buy, uh, the leveraged long options you could buy on Bitcoin, um, there are no puts available longer than 12 months so nobody in the market is is offering um puts longer than 12 months which is interesting um and and i think i think that's partly because they see the asymmetric <laughs> uh pressure to go long on on this deal i think the the other one that's really interesting is looking at all of the looking at the call option strike prices for each one of the expiration dates, the furthest out you could go, I think is $380, Yeah, which is insane to me. Yeah. All right. And, and the premiums on those are, exp they're expensive, right? Like you're, you're paying, oh, what is it? Like, I don't know, December, 2025, 380s are paying $31 of premium per share. So you're paying $3,000. What is that? Is that three thousand dollars? Um, three thousand dollars per contract. Um, yeah, so paying three thousand dollars per contract. Which, if you look, if you go look at call options on any other stock like Starbucks or Apple or something like that, and you go to the same expiration and you go into the tail, like you go as far out as you possibly can, the premium that you pay on those types of equities is just so materially less, and there are much more dollar options available. So. To me, what's what that is is the market. The market is scared to offer lower premium options in the tail at strike prices that are too far out because they have no no ability to be certain that that, that they aren't going to get hit. Right? They're they're not going to offer thousand dollar options for twenty cents because the likelihood that that it gets hit. Is is much greater than the twenty cents premium that they would be um, getting. Uh, the market makers would be getting from selling those options. So it, it's a it's a really interesting dynamic. I think there would be significant demand from retail investors and institutional investors to buy options with strike prices that are way further out. And um, I think it's pretty telling that they aren't available. <laughs> they aren't available because I, I think. The market, the market thinks it's going to get blown out. Um, who knows how that changes over time? But uh, I mean, shoot, we could blow out 380 with QQQ inclusion. Right. Like it, it can, it can happen in a month. It could go. <laughs> like we are. That's we're talking about the micro strategy going from 36 billion, 35 billion to 70 billion doubling. Um, very, very possible. Uh, very possible um, in a month or a month and a half. So pretty crazy. Um, I, I like the perspective of skew. Yeah, I mean, we see this in the VIX complex. Um, it always bothers me that you can't buy VIX calls for more than like one year out. And for me, that's where it starts to get like, okay, I'm really timing the market instead of just owning an exposure for two or three years. Um, and yeah, we, and you and I have talked about this, the, the strikes. Um, even before this March and the massive run up, the strikes only went to like twelve hundred. So I remember buying the twelve hundreds, and um, well, that, was, that was the highest one. It, when when I when I first started buying options on MicroStrategy in twenty early twenty twenty three, the furthest out I could go was four sixty. So which was which is <laughs> four which is forty six dollars today, and I was I was like, I was like, oh my god, you know. Um, and and the premium on them was expensive then. I think at per per contract was like three to five thousand dollars for the tail at at, at four sixty, which is again adjusted forty six dollars per share. But you know it's pretty telling. I, I even emailed CBOE. <laughs> to, like I emailed CBOE. I was like, can you give me some more strikes in the tail on MicroStrategy on on the January seventeenth? Um, and, uh, yeah, no, it never happened. So I, I think, uh, yeah, a couple more, like more released as, as time went on, but, um, it's pretty interesting that no, no more have been released recently for some of the longer data leaps. 
Yeah, and the, the good thing there is that as an underline goes up, like if it starts like pushing towards 300, there will be new strikes created like very quickly. They can turn this stuff, they can turn that stuff on or off with the click of a button. So, and that also kind of ties into the, the theory of gamma squeezes because as the underlying's going up, there's more option contracts that are created and then there's typically more people behind those option contracts that are created. So then it increases the amount of the underlying MSTR or the underlying Tesla back in the day that the market makers would have to buy and own in order to stay market neutral. And that kind of goes into like what I was suggesting about BlackRock, but that's a very like Wall Street-esque thing where like they're not really like risk takers. They just want to profit from all of the people who are taking risks. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, right. So yeah, there's if the stock does go up, there will be more created. But yeah, I mean, I of course wish the strikes went up to like a thousand today. You know what I mean? And the twelve hundred I was talking about last time is now one hundred and twenty dollars because of the because uh, of the split there. But um. What yeah. do you think? You want to roll into the variance? Yeah, let's go. Let's go into into applied implied vol. I mean, if if CBOE is listening, please release thousand dollar strikes on uh, twenty twenty five uh, <laughs> expiration dates. I will be eating those up. Um, my my DCA strategy is you know buying micro strategy and long leap options all the time. <laughs> yes, forever. Especially in this cycle, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember uh, on LinkedIn, I've really like slowed down the LinkedIn because it's just like too much corporate propaganda. But I remember like <laughs> even before you and I met, so true. there was this, uh, there was this <laughs> one guy who was like the ultimate like clueless bear on micro strategy, so pessimistic about Sailor and all that stuff. And I don't start wars, but I will get involved if someone else starts the war. And I remember telling him like, would you sell me a uh, two thousand dollar with the with MSTR trading like three hundred bucks? I was like, would you sell me a two thousand dollar you know strike call option? Because it pisses me off that they only go up to you know twelve hundred. So yeah, we're we're working through that. We're doing the best we can, but there is a value unlock on the backside of all of this stuff just by virtue of the underlying going higher. Yeah. Okay, so this um, this chart that we're looking at here, if it looks familiar, it's from that, uh, what did I call it, the MSTR explosion thread, where I went through kind of all of the catalysts that I see for this cycle. And that's also one of the other important like underlying ideas that we keep coming back to, is that no one catalyst exists in a vacuum, right? Where how like Doc Kruger will be like, oh, El Salvador doesn't matter or Hong Kong having ETFs doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the US spot Bitcoin ETF where I personally would just push back on that so massively and say like, no, there's value creation here. There's an acceleration of, of game theory over here and all of these things, you gotta look at the whole cake, not just your favorite ingredient from the from the mix. So this this is the chart that I that I started off the explosion thread with, and this has really been like one of the most interesting things I think for me to study about micro strategy, because I got introduced to like true long volatility from studying Christopher Cole. He's influenced me, you know, one of the top five investors who who have ever existed, who have you know made videos and made documents and research paper i mean his work has just influenced me tenfold and we've, we've talked about him in the past when we talked about soros and everything like that and i'll keep talking about it in the future most likely but yeah so i entered the volatility space on like the true long vol side right looking at asymmetric risk reward bets that could also provide a hedge to my risk assets Luckily, I haven't touched traditional long vol in the past two years and was really just loading the boat on the long side. But that's that's where we're at now. And using everything that Christopher Cole has talked about in videos and, and written in his research papers, to then be able to apply that to the long volatility dynamics of micro strategy, it's just been like a very, very fascinating thought experience. Um, so let's let's unpack some of the, the components here. This thick white line up top, that's MSTR price. This teal blue line that's overlaid onto price is the price variance. And I arrive at that calculation from take the open, high, low, close price of, of that day. 
and you just run the variance calculation on Excel. Of course, I have this programmed into Thinkorswim, and I have this code on the on the GitHub as well. I'm trying to really beef that up. But it just takes the, the variance of the open, high, low, close each day. And it's really a measure of dispersion. If you hear variance, think dispersion, right? The prices can all fall like very close to each other, or they can be spread out much further. And that's basically what things like standard deviation and variance um, measure. The reason I think variance at the daily level is such a cool kind of, not that we're like TA, technical analysis guys, but it's something that's cool to plot and just be you know cognizant of. Because what mostly happens with uh, price variance, and just to, just to give people context on the chart, we're starting here at August 10th of 2020, and this is the whole, this is the whole Bitcoin history of microstrategy right here. The thing about variance that's interesting is it almost always marks the tops in, in assets that move like this, a la NVIDIA, Tesla, Bitcoin, MicroStrategy. The blow-off tops tend to have you know, a very distinct explosion in variance, so much so that it basically just rides the bottom of all of, all of the price action except like the massive mania tops. And you can see down here, like right now, the variance is at less than one. The peak for variance was almost 400 on this, this left scale right here. The peak for variance was 400. The, the peak in the, the prior blow on top in February of 2021 was in this like 120 you know, range. And I think we're going to be looking at a variance that may very well be, you know, well, it wouldn't even, it wouldn't even move like that in that trajectory. I think we're going to be looking at a variance that's going to stay flatlined at the bottom, which is good, right? One of the messages that I'm going to say from explaining this chart is like, I think where all systems go, we want variance to kind of hang out at the bottom. And we can use 2023 as a great example of that. MicroStrategy went from, you know, split adjusted prices. I'm looking at a low of like 14 right here. And at year end, it was at, you know, $70. So the price went up by like, you know, a factor of four, a factor of five across 2023. Variance was flatlined the whole time. Variance didn't really start to move until, what are we looking at, March 1st? That was like the inflection point, and then that lasted almost an entire month. That's crazy. So by just using like a directional, you know, I think the variance is going to be even higher on like the next the next speculative mania blow off top because of all the catalysts. I'm not going to run through them, but of course the S&P 500 being the biggest one, it might be like the biggest dollar volume average moment in all of MicroStrategy's history. So I think there's reason to believe that you know the next peak in variance is going to follow this trajectory and we might be in the one thousand dollar area. For me, why does that matter? That's going to be a place where I'm going to be looking to, you know, sell or exercise my <clears throat> sell or exercise my call options. But and I'm not sure if we got to this, but me and Jeff were talking about a, a space that I was on recently, and people were saying like, "Yeah, I, I get it. You're going to sell the calls at whatever seems like the most advantageous point. Got that." But what about the stock itself? Are you going to trim if there's a cycle top around Thanksgiving of next year? And the, the reason that I'm, I'm not going to is just a, a simple matter of cost basis, right? If my cost basis, or no, I think we did talk about this, the 1200 the drawdown to 400 or so. The, mm -hmm. the, the point of that story was if you know, MSTR peaks to 1200 might be higher, might be lower. If there's a drawdown all the way down to 300 bucks, that's still six times higher than, than my cost basis. So yeah, the, the moves, I would expect the moves to be like violent and non-linear with some drawbacks, but I'm not gonna be able to achieve a lower cost basis or own more micro strategy. Plus then you factor in the taxes. So I'm, yeah. not, I'm not trading the stock. Yeah, I, I think that's the, the, I mean, you hit the really interesting component right there. Like, Anybody that has a, like, if you look at the January 17th, 2025 call option expiration, there's a ton of options that are currently extremely far in the money. Like 
like way in the money. They've got, you know, $20, $40, $50, $60 strike prices. That is the last time that those people are ever going to have the opportunity to buy MicroStrategy for that price ever. I would imagine. Ever. Um, So the incentive to exercise is significantly higher than the incentive to roll the option because the premiums are so high for (laughs) rolling rolling the options, we, you're, you're basically taking this this very certain, extremely far in the money, like profit already, you know, solidified in, in the trade to your opportunity cost of like taking on even more risk and potentially risking more in long dated calls. So, you know, I think anybody that's holding the very far in the money options that expire in January are likely going to exercise because that de-risks the position while also staying long. And um, I I think that's an important consideration, right? Like who are you competing against here? You're competing against market makers. This is a historic trade. January 17th, 2025 is a historic option, uh, option expiration date. I guarantee you Wall Street is not prepared for the level of retail investors that own those options and are going to exercise them. They're going to find out a way to do it. And the stock split actually helps. The stock split helps because it increases the liquidity of options. So if they needed to sell a couple couple options in order to exercise, that's a far better, safer trade than rolling your option into further dated long call options. Additionally, if you exercise, it doesn't... um, It restarts the clock for long-term capital gains. However, there's no capital gain event. There is no taxable event if you are exercising your options. So there are people that are sitting on multi-million dollar options positions, and they're going to be rolling those into, uh, they're not going to roll them into longer dated options. They're going to be exercising them, which is putting more pressure on the market makers to deliver the shares um, which is just pressures the entire trade, right? Like not only do you have QQQ looking for shares, not only do you have all of these other uh, in the market gap weighted index funds looking for shares and, you know, expanded retail interest. You also have market makers that are looking to fil- fulfill uh, all these options that they sold. They're probably hedged. I don't think that they're hedged enough for what is on the horizon. Um, and that's also like, it's a, a, a very hard to quantify comment like that is very hard to quantify comment but i like just my understanding of the traditional finance world i really think that market makers underestimate the irresponsibly long crew and uh how how like how far into the future people are looking here at this trade so um yeah no cool stuff cool stuff and and i mean you're right like shit you could put a little rocket sign right next to the teal blue on the on the bottom like this is probably this is ready to this is ready to explode and similar to if you look at honestly Ryan you should probably look at this in log you should probably look at this in log um, variance, yeah, of course. yeah you should probably look at this in log um, that might give you a better perspective but anyway cool stuff I mean just to go ahead up the, uh, the bottom half here um, we talked to we talked about Jeff Park's work with the iBet options and by the way we hmm. do want to have him on the show I think that is yeah I reached out to him really really rich conversation the thing that i want to point out about the the bottom half of the screen we got implied volatility in the blue and the volume in the white gray i basically went with the same color scheme format because i think all these things are all all of these things are basically you know reflecting the the same information as all of them with a little bit of a caveat for implied fall of um you know may of, of 2022 but the, the very interesting takeaway that I want to reference with implied volatility, and Jeff Park actually, that's why I want to give him credit on this, he really planted the seed with this one specific point. What he says is typically with all call, call option derivatives, as the underlying asset, in this case micro strategy, as the underlying asset goes higher, the implied volatility tends to go lower. Right, and it's 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 true because I went back and looked at a bunch of things, Tesla. I looked at Nvidia. I looked at some of the other, you know, Apple, Googles of the world, and and most of them, except Tesla and parts of Nvidia, have like much less vol in 
relative terms compared to micro strategy, but it was so true what Jeff was saying, what Jeff Park was saying in, in regards to as the underlying goes up, the implied volatility typically goes down. And just to hammer in that point real quick, let me just show the, the Tesla top. So Tesla peaked, uh, it doesn't give me the year lines on here. Here's 2021. Uh, oh, yeah. Tesla peaked in this area of time right here at a considerably lower. And Tesla's level. red. Tesla's red. Tesla's red. Thank, thank yeah. you for that. Sometimes I miss those details. Yeah. Tesla's red because Jeff has seen this chart before. But, you know, Tesla's price peak corresponded with like it's almost low of this entire five year view that we're looking at. Plus, Tesla did mostly did not keep pace with um, with the VIX, which is the white line, which I think is also a very interesting takeaway, especially because micro strategy in the teal blue line has mostly moved at the level of, of where the VIX is, and also considerably higher, like the March 2024 top in the price. And the reason that I think that's so interesting is because you just get you get this double whammy of value creation on those call options because not only is the call option becoming more valuable just by virtue of the underlying going higher, which is what we all know, we've all come to expect, but the implied volatility is mostly correlated with price, and we can see that with both blow off tops and you know late 2020 and early 2021 implied volatility it didn't like rocket ship up but it just kept grinding higher as my Chris strategy was grinding higher and then we look at the you know more recently march 2024 we got kind of this vertical move up in implied volatility and like the call option contracts also went up in implied vol and what we know about options theory is that an option will be more valuable if the implied volatility is higher it's the reason that Verizon and you know Johnson and Johnson have very little implied volatility in, in their calls or puts, and why micro strategies is a lot higher. This is what the market's expectation is for change in the price, aka volatility, because volatility equals change. This is what the market is suggesting, like their implied um, movement for what could happen. In the underlying and just just seeing the implied volatility go up in unison in a highly correlated fashion with the stock price i just think is a phenomenal insight again credit to jeff park on that and then one last thing here so we can wrap this um this chart up is volume is typically also associated in the volatility family of of metrics and measurements and we really see that here. I mean, the, the volume before the Bitcoin era was flat. The call options had no volatility. As they get into to the, to the, the Bitcoin strategy, volume starts to pick up. And here's, here's where it looks more like um, you know, traditional volatility, which implies that like, the asset is going down in price. There's also some corresponding large volume bars there, which is to be expected. Where it gets interesting is that there's an absolute mania of volume and a mania in implied volatility happening as the stock price goes higher. And I was talking to Sharish about this at MSTR World. He was saying, you know, in these days, micro strategy was more liquid than like Apple, Microsoft, like the, the, the tech titans of our time. So again, we should, we should look at Catalyst as like the entire cake and really like take all of these different things into consideration and not just be like, oh, this matters, this doesn't matter. I think what we're looking at here on this chart is all systems go. I couldn't, I couldn't set it up better if I wanted to. When we look at the, um, the typical U-shaped pattern of volatility, like if you just look at a VIX chart, it typically moves in like U's of different sizes, kind of like how it did here. And we're seeing like the curl up and implied volatility starting to start. We're seeing, you know, volume start to also go higher and move with implied volatility. You know, while search interest, going back to the Google thing, while search interest is so consolidated and at a small, like uh, a small number, and we've got variance doing its thing with, you know, setting up that, that flat line base. So all systems are go on this stuff. Amazing. Good work. Unique perspective. I mean, this is like, 
uh, 201 stuff for sure. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. 201. Maybe, yeah. Maybe 301, 401. Um, yeah, no, it's you, you, 101. 101. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to the, uh, the danger zone. That's why we're in sunglasses. It's getting hot in here. You know, <laughs> blaring. These screens are blaring with some information. It's great stuff. Um, awesome. No, it's all good, Brian. Um, cool, man. Should we, what, what was the, what was the last topic that we had here? It was, uh, oh no, that was it. Yeah, I, I hit through all mine. Okay, amazing. Well, um, you know, I, there's a couple other things I did want to talk about. I mean, just la- last minute topics, and you know, we'll just let this run and we'll see where it goes. I mean, shit, this is probably going to end up being a another two hour deal. Um, but uh, some crazy stuff that's happening, um, and you know, I guess I did want to just tell one story, like thinking about collateral, right? Like Bitcoin as collateral. I posted this the other day. Um, you know, Bitcoin is has got a unique prospect of being the best collateral on the planet you know a lot of these words are pristine collateral and and what does that mean it's like it's global it's liquid Um, there are people at multiple places across the globe that are willing to buy it and accept it um, as form of money Um, it's liquid it's transparent you can track and you can see like bitcoin moving on exchanges like the ledger is public you can see it Um, and you know last Last year, 2023, I was looking at joining an insurance company called Vestu. Um, this company, Vestu, they were, um, you know, I was looking to join to help increase the usage of insurance leaked securities and collateralized reinsurance in the insurance world. So uh, the goal was to bring more of like this outside capital that sat outside of the traditional insurance and reinsurance system, like just a typical hedge fund and use those like dollars as collateral in these insurance and reinsurance transactions, very big transactions. Um, and like they, they ended up getting, you know, very complex and nuanced over the last decade. Um, as, as this money was looking for alternative ways, um, to get return that was diversified from the rest of their portfolio, right? Like, Insurance and reinsurance is completely separate. It's got a different risk return trade off. Like you're betting on the weather. Like the weather has like no connection to how the stock market moves. So it's like a different volatility, different VIX, different risk return, the whole thing. So, you know, we had all of these investors from outside capital. They're looking to use their dollars in a different way. They're getting into the reinsurance world. Now, um, I was about to join this company and I got a text message from, uh, from my old boss at the time, it's uh, you know, it, it's an article. It says Vestu um, investigated by the FBI for a four billion dollar fraud with the Chinese bank. And so this was uh, this was a, a fraud case where like this company had been around since I think 2018, and they had um, signed on to reinsurance transactions for years. I think three or four years. Um, and it turns out that the collateral that was used in those transactions was fraudulent. It didn't exist. Like the money didn't exist. Um, the reason it didn't exist is that there was a, there were these letters of credit from these Chinese banks, um, that were saying like, Oh, this money does exist. And it sits behind, um, you know, this, you know, Chinese construction bank in, um, in China, it turns out the money didn't exist. The letters of credit were fraudulent. The reinsurance treaties were, there was no money sitting behind the transaction. Now, Let's think about a, like Bitcoin as collateral uh, for the reinsurance world. Let's say you wanted to bet on the hurricane season in 2025. And you like, right? Let's just say you wanted to pledge $100 million of collateral to bet on the hurricane season in 2025 if a hurricane is going to hit Florida or not. It just sounds nuts. <laughs> it, dude, it happens. This is, this is, uh, this is what I do. I, I structure, I, I design financial structures for weather. <laughs> like that is my, that is my job. So like imagine pledging a hundred million dollars of collateral to bet on whether, whether or not there's going to be a hurricane in Florida in 2025. Um, and let's just say the, the return on that is, uh, 50%. Like if there's no hurricane, you get $150 million. If there's a hurricane, you lose your hundred million dollars. Now this, this is, um, the, the reason this is important. Sorry, I've said bad risk reward. Bad. Yeah, sh- sure. Maybe it's not. Well, it depends on where it attaches, right? Like these are excess of loss treaties. So the, an insurance company has to sustain a certain amount of loss before the reinsurance treaty kicks in. So, so like if, if a cat three hits Florida, 
no loss. Cat four, cat five hits Florida, then you start to have loss. Kind of like that. That's how you think of it. Now, um, in this situation to avoid fraudulent collateral, um, it, somebody can theoretically pledge Bitcoin. Let's just say, let's just say they had 90% of their position in treasuries and 10% in Bitcoin. Um, that, that money could be pledged into a collateralized account and such that both sides of the transaction have custody. Like it could be programmed, like that transaction can be programmed. So, so you can, you can have basically a multi-sig, you can have a multi-sig collateralized transaction be programmed into, into like holding this Bitcoin where the insurance company holds a key and the reinsurance company holds a key. And if certain things are satisfied, it's basically like an if then statement in Excel. Like if there's a cat five that hits Florida, insurance company gets all the money. If there's no cat five that hits Florida, the reinsurer gets their money back and the premium, like the $50 million that was paid for that coverage. And you would know, you would be able to track it on the ledger. Like you could, you could see the transaction. Like there's going to be, there's demand. I, I think this is a really good business opportunity for anybody that wants to run with this. I think there's demand for like, um, collateral escrow for Bitcoin, like collateral escrow, well, like, um, tech collateral escrow tech, where you can show like, look, this Bitcoin hasn't moved. You, you are both custodying this Bitcoin and like anybody that's holding it in for a future liability can see it. Like you can see it. Um, and you can know that it's there. Yes. There's volatility. Like you have to be okay with the volatility. And so that's why, you know, I propose the idea of 90% treasuries, 10% Bitcoin. Um, and that's a way you start to generate yield on your Bitcoin holdings. Now that's an extreme example, right? Bringing up Florida. Um, like that's just gambling. That's basically just like rich people gambling. Um, but it happens. Um, but like a, a, a more reasonable option in yield averaging Bitcoin, maybe like, um, a life insurance reinsurance transaction where the tail of the exposure is much longer. The duration of the exposure is much longer. And in that scenario, like uh, the prospect of Bitcoin looking at the four year performance the prospect of putting Bitcoin as collateral in that transaction is like, that's a phenomenal trade. That's a phenomenal trade. Um, even then, like uh, I'm going to talk to a couple guys about Bitcoin as collateral here in the future, but like, um, you know, mortgages can be built, you know, with using your Bitcoin as collateral where let's just say like, <laughs> I don't know, you work with JP Morgan Chase and they say, okay, well, you can use your Bitcoin as collateral to get this mortgage on this house. And if your price of Bitcoin goes up, like it will actually just, you, it can, it can pay off your loan. Like you can use it to pay off your loan. They just, they just hold on to it. And that gives them like the ability to, um, you know, continue to do other, you know, economic things with it. So it's an interesting concept. The concept of collateral is that's the Trojan horse, right? Like, um, well, actually, I think holding it as an asset is the Trojan horse or like insurance companies, pension funds, banks, they're all going to start putting this on their balance sheet. And then there's going to be this idea of like, wait a minute, what do I like? I can do stuff with this. <laughs> like MicroStrategy, they're just, they're like piling it in. Like they, they know that there's no sense in trying to figure out how to get a yield on it right now because the, the incentive to pile on and get as much Bitcoin as it can right now is like way higher than trying to earn a yield on it and figuring out a yield in like, um, in the current infrastructure. But you know, four years from now, eight years from now, like that conversation is going to be a lot different where you're like, all right, well, Bitcoin's at a million, um, 2 million, I'm sitting on $300 billion of capital. Like maybe I'll put a billion dollars of capital at work. <laughs> and test out these yield, these yield um, products uh, to facilitate uh, economic commerce. So I don't know. I'm I'm incredibly bullish on the concept of um, of collateral. And um, yeah, and <laughs> just to add on to that, you asked about this before we got on this call. I went and saw Michael Saylor speak in New York, um, like a month ago when he did that presentation on digital gold rush. In New York, in Manhattan. It was in New York. It was in Manhattan. Yeah, it was in Midtown, and it was a, the, it, it was a, it was a pretty small room. I think the room was about like 150 people, um, but it was full of investment bankers, wow. and like <laughs> that's something that most like most people don't aren't aware of, right? Like that video is available 
on YouTube, but you don't see who he's speaking to. And I, I mean, all of his podcasts, he, he's got like amazing material on podcasts, but it's like him and one other person. But I was there. I witnessed it. Like it was a room full of investment bankers in midtown Manhattan that want to see how the, the world of crypto and Bitcoin are evolving and developing over time. Vive- Vivek Ramaswamy, Ramaswamy spoke the, the day prior. Um, and then uh, a, co- yeah, a couple other really big name people were speaking at that thing. So it wasn't like it wasn't a small deal at all. And it was kind of crazy. Like after he spoke, um, people like swarmed him at the elevator. <laughs> it was, like, it was um, you know, everybody's trying to get pictures and talk to him and probably pitch him stuff. But um, yeah, it's uh, uh, that made me incredibly confident again on, in this trade, just thinking uh, he presented incredibly well. It was a group full of uh, very wealthy people, investment bankers that are at the forefront of like e-commerce in the in the in the country in the world. So yeah, and I, yeah. And, and you know what else? I would bet the Vivek met with Sailor during that. You know, oh yeah, the, oh yeah. The Vivek's kind of been. I put him in like the Bobby Kennedy category of like being super down to like you know they get it Bitcoin. They'd be down to put it on the balance sheet. And again, who better to talk to than Sailor himself on something like that? And um, I I really liked what you said. And I'm gonna get to the bear instrument too. So don't don't let me forget that. But I thought it was really interesting how you specifically referenced the um, the crowd size or just how many people were in the room. I sound like Donald Trump now, like referencing the crowd sizes, but I, huge I, I, <laughs> people waiting outside in the line, <laughs> freezing cold. They wanted to see me. No, no. <laughs> I think the crowd size thing is, is is actually very relevant in this scenario because um, I was talking about this in the, the MSTR den, the Discord. It's like when I was at MSTR World, the um, the first two days were mainly just nice. The first two days were um, were mainly just you know focused on like the AI, AI, like the software business, and then the last two days were mainly focused on Bitcoin. And there was way more people attending the BI AI software, you know, um, couple of days than there were in the Bitcoin um, rooms. Wow! And, you know, you got me, Grain of Salt, Jeff Trush, great guy, uh, Martian, um, Tom. There, there was like we had a great table, and we're sitting front row listening to Michael Saylor at you know nine o'clock in the morning. I've had like three coffees. Like I'm pumped for this, right? And I look around, there's only like 300 people in the room. It's a rough guess, but like, let's call it 300 people. But then, and this is where it gets interesting, is that you look at the Berkshire Hathaway annual conference, and you can put Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, God rest his soul, up on a, on a plastic table with two chairs, and they'll sell out like an NFL arena of people who are traveling from every part of the earth imaginable to come listen to, you know, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger talk for eight hours about any any question under the sun, and they'll sell out massive things. So again, to kind of the the sailor point, the um, all all this other stuff, like that's the investment opportunity amongst other catalysts. Obviously, is like think about, and I was saying this in the Discord. Think about MSTR World 2050. So about 25 years from now. I think we're going to be in an NFL size like <laughs> for sailors. Like, you know, That's true. Time. He's going to come out looking like a wizard. He's going to have like you know AI like bitcoins like hologram generated around him, and it's 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 going to be a really interesting show. But I think the crowd size is going to be way bigger. And um, the other thing about him, like getting to talk to him for a couple minutes at a time, because um, again he was swarmed by everyone. Um, so you don't, you don't want to try and like monopolize his time or anything, but he's exactly the same person on like Lex Friedman or any of these podcasts that he's been on. He's exactly that same person in person. Like he'll do like the, like he'll do the size, the mannerisms are exactly the same. He's a straight shooter. And I think perhaps his most, um, his coolest attribute is that he's just another pleb. Like, he really doesn't put himself, like, I, I never got that feeling that he was walking around, like, thinking he's better than people. What I think of him is as, like, the college professor that we all wanted. 
that we weren't like sleeping through that class. We, we actually wanted to be there. And we wanted to go to office hours to, to just learn more from this person. And um, That's so true. So, yeah, That's so true. And, and just, just like the pl- – like he's so down to earth. That's what I was getting at with, with the pleb thing. So you put all this stuff up into, you know, one package. And, again, it's just an incredibly compelling opportunity on the, the cult-like following part. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, and I mean, go ahead. Go ahead. The um the other thing I was going to say about the the point that you were making before the uh, HC Wainwright event, I think it was called. Oh yeah. Was um Bitcoin is like an actual legitimate bearer instrument, not a debt instrument. And I'm sure there's like a more formal like well-written um, definition for what a bear instrument is but to me that's that's the real asset that's the real gold not gold as like the etf version of gold but like those oh yeah hundred ounce bars it does you not, can hold it. it does not produce a yield you can hold it it's the real bear instrument instead of like treasuries which i get they do they do serve they do serve a point like what you were talking about the 90 10 um, my buddy, I, th- I think his name's Andrew, met him at MSTR World. He was talking about something, structured credit, very similar to what, to what you're talking about there. But this is the real bearer instrument. And it's better than gold in every conceivable way with the verification issue, the custodial issue, the, you know, you can't move it through time and space. So now we have like an upgraded version of gold where there's enough transparency and running a node of being able to do the programmatic functions you were talking about. So, and I, I really hope that the catalyst for everything I just said is banks being able to custody Bitcoin. That news drops like yeah. uh, with the yeah. day of when Jeff Park wrote his piece about the negative Vanna gamma of potentially for IBIT options. Sailor posted the thing about, you know, the potential for banks to be able to custody. And I think that is like a massive, massive catalyst. And it could bring to fruition a lot of the things that you were talking about as it pertains to collateral, insurance. Yeah, that's how you do it. Like you need a bank to hold it. Like you need, you need somebody. Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, a bank needs to custody it. I mean, look, most reinsurance transactions that we do are like um, the money that's pledged for the deals sits in a bank. Right. <laughs> like, that's how it works. You've got um, insurance company, reinsurance company, let's just say like hedge fund that has hella cash, insurance company that has risk. Right. Insurance company wants to buy reinsurance from the people that have a ton of money. The hedge fund? The, the hedge fund that's got tons of risks or that's got tons of capital. Um, the hedge fund will pledge dollars to a bank, a third party bank. They'll lose, they'll put a hundred million dollars in the bank. Um, and that hundred million dollars may be made up of treasuries, equities, bonds, you know, a bunch of different types of things, but all liquid, all liquid. And the insurance company, uh, effectively now has, coverage for the year so the insurance company like no matter what happens throughout the year like you know um mount rainier can blow up or like there's a hurricane or whatever like that company can access that money at any point in time if they need it at the end of the treaty period at the end of the year if that capital isn't used that money goes back to the original hedge fund so there's this third party that's involved that holds everything so that I, I could see a future where you've got banks in this, in, in this instance, custodying Bitcoin and they're like, oh yeah, we've got rails to do this now. Like, oh yeah, we've got coders that sit in our back, you know, they sit like in a vault, you know, somewhere in New York and they're like, you know, running this custody and keeping track of all things, of all of our deals and where they sit. And more, more than likely it's code that makes it automated. Um, or there's, you know, multi-sig, multi-sig opportunities for multiple people to custody and hold those things at the same time. So it's an interesting, (laughs) it's just collateral. Like it's just like, it's not just a store of value. It's collateral. Like it can be, it can be pledged. It can be pledged for anything. Um, it, the, the rails for it are really young and like not mature, but 
people want to use their Bitcoin to do stuff. And like, that's good. That's going to change over time. I mean, the demand is just so high for that <laughs> and it will continue to get higher as people, as more people buy it. So yeah, it's fun stuff, man. And, and just to add on that real quick, I, I think there is going to come a time when there's more regulatory um, clarity, like the Gary Gensler era is not going to last forever, especially in a, in a Trump victory. If we're talking about guys in the cabinet are Bobby Kennedy Jr. and Vivek, they might clear house and then just let like Wall Street do what it knows how to do with all these other assets, but provide the necessary like SEC level clarity on like, yes, banks can do this and, and all that, all, all of those things. Hopefully that's a, a potential catalyst. Yeah. And you've got like, I mean, there are definitely regulatory hurdles. Like, yeah, I mean, in the insurance industry in general, like for example, you've got regulators that need to allow you to use this stuff as collateral and and have it go into how your company is rated it gets into like rating agencies viewing it and you know there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done but like it's going to be done like the, people are going to start doing this stuff as it, it's just it's pervasive you can't stop this thing and like nothing stops this train it, it's going to keep going the the incentives too i mean the incentives are going to prove to be prosperous for everyone for everyone, even the, yeah. Even the Black Rocks of the world, even if they don't take a Bitcoin position, they'll be collecting those expense fees in perpetuity. And we can also find other similar like ways that it benefits traditional Wall Street, the insurance companies, this this middleman in between the hedge fund. Like the incentive structure can, and I think will be very much more aligned as as we get this clarity. Yeah, I mean the the incentives. This isn't a zero sum game. It's not like there's a winner and a loser. Like Bitcoin, Bitcoin is a discovery of storage of economic value without decay. So everybody can win here. Um, you're, you're taking technological innovation and you're actually putting it back in everybody's pockets as opposed to it being, you know, thrown away towards, you know, perverse incentives in the fiat economy and how it's designed, right? Like, if we've had so much technological innovation and, um, you know, <laughs> like food and like, uh, and all this stuff, like, why is it more expensive? And it would be interesting to see a world in which, you know, your storage of energy is a little bit more efficient and, um, you know, that benefit of technological innovation actually goes back to the people right? It, just because of your, your storage of energy is more efficient. Yeah. I mean, that's, Oh my gosh, that, that, that's a very powerful point. And people shouldn't have to be active investors in the way I would say we definitely are. We're very locked into this stuff. We don't, we're not placing trades every day, but we're very locked in on the information and you can't have doctors and scientists and nurses and firemen determining like should i dump all my money into apple computer and like is steve jobs gonna like make me rich like they shouldn't have to be doing that yeah it should be illegal to at least just keep what they've earned and storage. storage savings right. savings right. and that's what bitcoin is bitcoin is savings technology sure it's the best savings technology that's ever been created agreed yeah uh, yeah it's like oh, like i'm not storing it in dollars like that's just absolutely silly um, yeah, oh, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. The incentives are cool. Like the, the, I mean, what a, what a cool thing. I mean, Bitcoin's cool as shit. I'm interested. <laughs> I mean, it's just so cool. Um, it's so, it's so interesting. I'm curious to see, um, this HBO documentary. I think it gets released tomorrow. That will be, uh, oh, this the is the one with Adam and Samson. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, it's uh, they claim to say that they know who Satoshi is, but I, I think this is going to be one of those things that like surprise everybody's Satoshi, you know, or like <laughs> something like that. I don't know, who knows? It's, it could be cheesy, it could be cool, but I don't, I don't think it, ma it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who it is. Um, I mean the 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 Satoshi wallet itself is proof of security of the network. Right. Like it's a $60 billion bounty. Come get it. Right. And like, it, like people freak out about this billion, this million coin Satoshi wallet of like, Oh, what if he dumps on the market? Like there's no incentive to do that. 
like it, it's really it's really proof of security and even if at some point it does get like quantum computing breaks it or something like i'm sure there will be a, a, a solution to you know <laughs> making it even more impossible for quantum computers uh to, to hack that that's that's even India. The risk factors for micro strategies, uh, 10Ks and 10Qs, is the chance of of Satoshi selling. Um, but yeah, I mean, oh, that's I, fun. I just, I, I of course just can't see that happening. And I, I think the broader thing with Satoshi is what I've come to learn over the years is that there should be an unspoken rule in Bitcoin, like rule number one of Fight Club is like you don't talk about Satoshi because. One of the most compelling things about Bitcoin is that there is there is an anonymous creator. It's not a known yeah. creator. And there's no CEO, there's no Vitalik, there's no Ethereum Foundation. And yep. to me, that's really the where I personally draw the line in the sand about is this a security or not a security. If you got a CEO, it's a security. I know the SEC clearly disagrees because of the ETF approval for Ethereum. Ethereum, but yeah. If you got a CEO, it's a security. That applies to companies, and that's really what Ethereum is. The foundation is just another word for corporation. Yeah. You know, so yeah, I, it's yeah. Bitcoin's an asset without an issuer. Right. That's 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 the whole thing. Yeah. It's an asset without an issuer. And then if and then if you look too, someone did a good write up about this on Twitter where it shows that there's like new people coming into Bitcoin because that is I think a rabbit hole that that we all go down. But what I saw and this is my goodness like the ultimate heartbreaker. I think it was within like six months ago, Natalie Brunel did a podcast with Fran Finney, and she was moved to tears i think natalie was moved to tears at separate times i think i was moved to tears at separate times where she talks about how finney's like later years and how there was such a um belief or a speculation that that how finney was satoshi and you know people like swatted him like sending like the swat over to your house and he just became like a massive public person of interest and he had either um, Parkinson's or Alzheimer's on the way out and he was going through this like nightmare of like attention that he clearly never wanted. So I think between that being like a real life point of impact that is, you know, heartbreaking, I, I, I think we should just not even like care who Satoshi is and because there's so much value in not having an issuer. Like you just said. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the person that created it knows that there's no incentive to like move anything from that wallet. More than likely that wallet's been burned or it's at the bottom of the ocean, right? It's like, go find a single atom in all of the atoms of the universe. Like that's, <laughs> that's like, that's it. Like that's, that's the computing power it needs to take to go find the Satoshi wallet. It's like, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. It's not worth the energy spent that would be spent to go find it. Right. So, yeah. Anyway, man, this has been fun. I think I think we should probably we should probably cut it. I mean, we've got two hours of content here. This is a good good deal. Let's go to good six deal. hours. Just six hours. I mean, the people the people would just eat it up. You know, everybody they would just love it. All right. Well, um, you got uh, any any final any final closing comments? No, I mean, this has been great, man. I mean, always, like, thoroughly enjoy looking forward to this. There, there's a funness to being in show business on our, like, little <laughs> small scale. Um, we're going to look to to keep doing this as frequently as we can. We got to bring other people back, like Ben. We got to bring Dan on, get Grant Assault on. We got to get Dylan LeClaire on. So yeah. one of the things I said back in the beginning is we will never run out of topics. Like, that's yeah, that's yeah. Not, and, and also interesting people to to bring on so not nothing further than that and um as always jeff this has been a ton of fun yeah absolutely and thank you to everybody for listening and continuing to listen to our journey uh this has been a ton of fun looking really really looking forward to q4 and 2025 i mean like it couldn't the setup couldn't be better <laughs> like, i'm just i'm so jacked 
Uh, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a lot of fun. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be throwing these weights around like all over the place, it's just you know ripping them. Um, <laughs> that's, the, that, that's the jack to the tip. Jacked. Yeah. Yeah. Jacked. Yeah. Jacked. Yeah. I'm just so jacked. Um, so yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for listening. I uh, appreciate the time. Keep putting out all of the good content. We love it. Um, and keep sharing everything. And we look forward to doing more of these. So. Quant Bros, signing off.